All right, here's a few news articles that I thought were interesting. Um, there is a AT&T device uh, sold to small businesses, but not apparently to normal end users, that has a default credential of like admin and default. And so it stuck it in a botnet, just like uh, several other botnets have occurred using the same kind of problem, where it's very easy, of course, to write software that will take it over and use it. And so it's running a botnet doing nasty things like DOS attacks and uh, other things to people. So uh, the problem is AT&T was told about this years ago, and they supposedly updated it, but they didn't actually inform their users, and they don't have any automatic update policy, so the users would have to manually update the firmware. So, of course, many people don't know it's vulnerable and haven't done that. So this kind of thing keeps happening with the Internet of Things. You have so many gadgets connected to the Internet, and quite a few of them are poorly made and hard to update, and they linger on as a hazard to the world. And the first Omicron in America has appeared here in California. So uh, it's somebody that came from South Africa um, earlier in November. So it's here. That person's contacts have tested negative, and that person is showing only mild symptoms because they had been vaccinated, or at least they had been vaccinated and they're showing mild symptoms. We don't really know that's because of the vaccination, but it seems like for the simplest explanation. So anyway, that's what we all knew was happening. Omicron is here in the next couple of weeks. We're going to find out uh, how bad it is. Hopefully it won't be any worse than Delta and we'll be able to carry on. Uh, in the worst case, we'll have to have more lockdowns and some new kind of booster and all that jazz. Um, I've been getting very interested in Bitcoin. Uh, especially because the main complaint against Bitcoin was that it messed up the environment and there are a lot of people trying to defend it. And uh, now the Columbia Climate School says it really is wasting a lot of power and encouraging a lot of dirty power generation to run Bitcoin. But Bitcoin is the only, um, I just read some articles on it, uh, Bitcoin is the only proof of work cryptocurrency that's popular anymore. All the new ones are moving to proof of stake which of course completely solves the problem. In a proof of stake, instead of uh, running a fast series of guesses, trying to guess a hash and trying to be the person that gets it first, or all these other people are trying to do the same thing, you just put money, You what happens is they pick one person randomly to get the award. Some people do the calculation and they just pick a random winner and the winner is chosen proportional to the amount of money you bet. And you have to bet a pretty large amount. And so you just invest some coins. And if you're lucky, you get a reward. And if you are found to have lied, then they cancel and kick you out forever and keep the bet. So that's the alternative way of enforcing it. And that doesn't require as much calculation at all. It cuts down the energy by 99.99% or something like that. And Ethereum is moving to that next year. And most modern cryptocurrency is moving to that. So um, anyway, there's quite a bit of argument that the environmental impact of Bitcoin can be moderated and probably will be. Perhaps not for Bitcoin, but for the other, um, the other cryptocurrencies. And there are some people actually trying to, uh, and there are some people saying that Bitcoin is in fact being mined with more and more green energy now because green energy is becoming cheaper than fossil fuel. Uh, so this, this climate disaster consequence of Bitcoin may well be going away. Anyway, um, I have been, I came across this, which is wonderful, and I put a few of these right here at the top. If you want to do a capture the flag over the break, I remember doing this kind of thing decades ago. I remember one Christmas break, my classes were over, and I was had nothing fun to do, so I got a book and learned statistics. I calculated the statistics for all the dice games I was playing at the time. Like risk, the statistics for risk were quite interesting. Anyway, now there's capture the flags. And this one I've been doing is admin of code. It's just a bunch of coding challenges. And there's one for every day right up through Christmas. And so I did the first couple and it's fun. You earn coins by doing it. And uh, anyway, then there's the famous Kringle Con from Sans and the same thing from Try Hack Me, a similar thing, Advent of Cyber. These are just ordinary um, capture the flags with different categories. Sans is very educational. So they have lectures you watch from famous people explaining things, and then you have challenges based on the things taught in that little lecture and so on. So anyway, these are, I'm sure there are more, but these are some of the 
the big famous ones. So check those out if you like. If you like to uh, continue studying something. Statistics for RIF S. Oh, risk. No, no, uh, your risk. Uh, risk is a dice game where you uh, have a map of the world and you're taking over with armies. And if you attack with like three armies and the other person defends with five armies, then you roll three dice and they roll five dice. And you compare the dice to see who wins. And therefore, the statistics are kind of complicated. That's all. So this was like in 1978 or 76 or something <laughs> before the Internet or anything. But it was the same thing as a lot of people. I'd been in class, you know, learning physics and math all the time. And when I got a Christmas break, there was no more physics and math to do, and I missed it. So I found something to do. <laughs> anyway. All right. So that's a fun thing to do, if you like. Um, this one is interesting and really quite logical. I mean, people who, um, who get COVID, it can be really serious. And a bunch of people have long COVID where they have, like, brain problems and heart problems lingering for months or years later, or at least months, probably years, we don't really know yet. And now they're showing that it is really bad for you. If you have severe COVID where you go to the hospital, you're likely to die after that. Even though your death may not be attributed directly to COVID, the odds are pretty good that being that sick does some serious harm to your body, which um, makes you more likely to die later. So, you know, it'd be a good idea not to get COVID or not to get sick from it. So uh, anyway, um, so Biden is going to improve the travel restrictions. I've heard a lot of criticism. Uh, the travel restrictions right now are pretty porous. The same thing was wrong with the ones Trump introduced in the early days. We, we block travel from a country that we know has the virus, but we don't really block travel. American citizens can come in and other categories of people can come in. So we still have people coming in from there. And the experts say what you ought to do, which is more important than blocking travel, is make everybody take a test, make everybody quarantine for a few days, and take another test, something like that, if they come from that country. Because we don't really care if people come from that country. We care if you have the virus. <laughs> and just being an American citizen doesn't make it okay to let you in. Although, probably, you really don't want to stop American citizens from coming home. That would really annoy them. But you certainly could make them take a test and maybe wait a few days and take another test, something like that. So they're, they're going to put in restrictions like that, which would really make a lot more sense. All right, and uh, you can get an ugly sweater from Microsoft with Minecraft on it. They do this occasionally, and some people really love these, uh, you know, historical uh, things to remind you of the old Microsoft games. And this one I thought was pretty great. They had a toaster in 1949 that's better than anything you get today because it always makes the toast perfect because what it does is it turns on a heater and it has a bimetallic temperature sensor that checks the temperature of the toast itself. And it pops up when the toast itself has hit a certain value. And it does it without any computers or anything, just by having a, a piece of metal, that a bimetallic strip with metal on one side, a different metal on the other side, that expand at different rates so it bends. And that breaks the circuit and causes it to pop up. And for some reason, the modern computerized toasters have not figured out how to do the same thing. So they say, this is amazing because you could put in bread that was frozen or refrigerated or room temperature, and it would always perfectly toast it. It will cook until the toast reaches the right temperature and pop it up. Whereas, anyway, a cute idea. Um, there must be a way to do this with the modern toasters, but, but for some reason, yes, now the toaster has Wi-Fi, but they don't actually cook the bread very well. So anyway... Uh, that's another issue of the Internet of Things. People do the fashionable stuff, and they don't actually make the fundamental purpose work to its best effect. Whoops. <laughs>